Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. As you can see, it is time for a sentence. Uh, this is another entry into the epic series, and I gotta say before we get this started that I need your replays. I have one more replay after this to cast, so I need some games from you guys. Anything with awesome stuff happening, many epic things, whatever you've got to throw at me, I would love to cast your game. So please send those replays. Um, you can send it. The easiest way is in the comments. Um, just link me either the replay ID number off of the file or what would be awesome is if you guys could Dropbox me or file share me the actual replay file because that is much less likely to be corrupted or to desync than the one that is stored on the central server. Okay, without any further ado, let's go ahead and introduce the players and then we will see where the game takes us. This is a little bit of a lower ranked sentence. Um, the lowest is 700 and the highest is 1200 and this is a pretty balanced game. The uh, pairs are matched up very evenly so this should, should give us a pretty adequate uh, balance situation. On the northern side we have <laughs> Z-O-M-G i.e. Zomji. Something like that. I, I realize what the OMG is, but I'm I'm trying to be creative with the name here, and it bring it is bringing a really hilarious mental image to mind. Taking Cybrin on the beach in the back, we have Germordy taking Aeon on the right hand rock. We've got that is Gizmo Dan taking Seraphim, and then on the front slot, Manslayer taking Aeon. On the southern side, we have Smokin' Dragon taking Aeon for the air. K-Hole taking Aeon on the beach. Muffin Man taking Cybern on the front. And Master Chef, Cybern on the rock. Master Chef, Master Chief, I'm not sure which one is funny there. It's either a Herpaderp Spartan or a... Yeah, I'm not sure why you would reference being a cook. On Supreme Commander but to each his own it is okay I'm gonna see a lot of normal expansion because this is Settens and let's face it Settens is a little bit of a turtle map and you're gonna have to run out and grab all of your mass extractors and we're probably not gonna see incredibly innovative build orders at this rank level K hole is definitely getting an early start on Navy that is for sure Manslayer beating Muffin Man by a wide margin to the mass. I'm going to go ahead and assume that Muffin Man built something before he left because there's no way that uh, he got there that late if he did not. And he is also not utilizing move commands, which Manslayer is. You can see Manslayer standing in one spot and reclaiming at great range, whereas Muffin Man is walking up to the Rex. One thing you got to realize about the front, the... Uh, it is asymmetrical so when you run to the front the southern side is actually slightly further away from the center of mass it takes them longer to walk to the Salem's than it does the north side but you do have easy access to this clump of five um, tech 3 wrecks here in the middle which actually contains more mass than the Salem's so if you're walking up from the southern side you definitely want to stop short I think the move order is about right there um, and there are five T3 wrecks you can suck up without moving and then move to grab the left side Salem and anything else you can get your grubby mitts on so just a little piece of advice there for those of you who care to take it on a little bit of front strategy I am by no means a pro player, but I have played a lot of games, so take it for what it's worth. And down here on the bottom side, we have Smokin' Dragon pausing and unpausing very rapidly, which is a sure sign of the Eco Manager mod, which uh, I kind of dislike. It is extremely buggy. You can technically make good use of it, but... To be honest, I don't know that it's worth it if it's only you by yourself. Yes, it keeps you from power stalling, but it really screws up your build priorities. Got one lonely little flare sneaking past Muffin Man's defenses. Is going to get harassed by a Medusa absolutely to death. Drop has already taken place for Gizmodan. Gizmodan uh, locking down his island very early. 
And on the left-hand side, it looks like OMG is also going to snag his island. So we've got both islands falling into the hands of the northern team. And now that the front build is over with, I'm actually going to bump the speed up so that uh, when the inevitable sentence slowdown hits later on in the game, we will not be stuck with an hour and 45 minute cast. And do please excuse me, I am still getting over the last little bit of that death rattle. So I will try to spare your ears the coughing. This was a nice little drop over here. OMG did drop a Medusa and an anti-air with four engineers. So that is a very nice touch. OMG is going to drop a lot of engineers and start reclaiming the point defense, but that Medusa is just going to lay them wide open. And reclaim the anti-air, just go on a reclaiming spree, why don't you? And the inaccuracy of the Medusa causes it to miss a couple times, and then there it is. So, fail of a drop. Probably could have gotten the island if that was microed slightly better, but it is okay. We shall forgive him. We got Tech 2, Navy in the water. K-Hole is actually very high on the scoreboard. Not quite as high on mass income as most of the other players, but he does have Tech 2 Navy in the water, allowing him to drop a sub in, and that is going to give him the opportunity to pull a Naval Denial, which I think will work out brilliantly. We've got a Tech 1 factory over there already in the water, but it is going to go down, I would think since there is only one sub and a frigate to guard it. A loop a de loop tech one air. What is this madness? Setton's air building tech one air. I don't think Smoke and Dragon realizes that he's actually supposed to be the guy that is teching at the expense of all the other players. What is this? A support player actually lending support? What has the world come to? Manslayer is building up a ridiculous amount of units here. He has got probably 30 Auroras or so. 34 to be exact. There is a Tech 2 point defense going down on the front. Two Tech 2 point defenses. There's going to be a double Cerberus turret. And Manslayer is actually at about half health. What upgrade was that that he got? He got the range it looks like range and gun and he's probably slapping the shield down on that commander and that will allow him to push uber hard without really any fear of repercussions got torpedo launchers going down that is going to easily deny the vespers down here it is kind of hilarious how well torpedo launchers counter subs at any any tech level other than uh, Tech 3 subs for Seraphim. These, uh, especially when you rush your subs all into the mess, because that's just not going to end well. Vesper's taking heavy hits and going down. So sad. Manslayer is trying to get that upgrade done, but Cerberus Turret is just hammering away at his commander. It is always depressing when you get a upgrade that far along, but luckily Manslayer does have way more units than the Muffin Man does, and he is going to be able to kill that Cerberus turret just barely, and that is going to give him a little bit more breathing room, but he's down to 2300 health. Not good at all. One advantage that he is going to have though is that if he can manage to finish that upgrade, he will have way more health than his opponent can deal damage to, so he will survive very, very handily. Shield upgrade on an unassisted Tech 1 commander out front. Not exactly the best strategy I have ever heard of. Cerberus turret coming online again. It means his commander is going to be under fire, dropping down to two. Almost done with the upgrade though. We can just hang on a little more, bearing down on Muffin's Calm. Look at the health drop on that thing with that. <laughs> down to about 1,100 health, and the shield has come online. 
So he is going to be able to push very hard with that. There is nothing Cerberus turrets can do against that commander. You can see under fire for about 45 seconds now, and he has barely hit 80% shield health. He's going to be able to overcharge everything to death before anything can lay a finger on him. Plus, he has the expanded gun range, so that is going to give him the ability to overcharge any naval units that come close by. He is going to run back due to the overwhelming force of Mantis out of all of these land factories, but I think he will be completely fine thanks to many, many, many overcharges. And he is pounding away at that shield. Needs to drop that thing and kill the shield gen itself. It only has 100 health. All he has to do is land one single hit on it. If he can get rid of that shield, the rest of that base is as good as Toasty Fried. But uh, at the moment, there are just so many Cerberuses going down. It's actually kind of depressing. The Cerberus turret should not have the ability to keep a fully upgraded commander away. But when you get this much density, uh, they actually do a fairly decent amount of damage. Muffin Man is going to have to run for the hills here. He's down to 3,000 health and his base is falling fast. He did lose his shield. Luckily, Auroras are moving up. There's Obsidians coming out. Manslayer has gone tech too. So good dealio for him. Up here on the northern side, we do have Cybern Navy, which means that actually it is Cybern versus Cybern. So we've got the uh, Mermaid. I love this right here. Brilliant little bit of micro from um, OMG. Putting the Mermaid out in front that allows the mermaid's torpedo defense to work at maximum potential and let those two subs easily kill the single sub without taking much damage at all. Manslayer is now under fire from a strat bomber, but there is a single ASF out for Jeremy Wordy. Jeremy Wordy. Germ Wordy. Sorry. That name is confusing my brain. And that one ASF is going to drop that strat bomber while all of these ASF and all these interceptors just kind of idle in the back. So that was a ridiculously pointless strap bomber. Um, a word of advice to Smoke and Dragon, if you can push your strap bomber over to the other side, you need to keep up with it with your ASF because it can win you air superiority as the enemy is focus firing on the strap bomber. And then you can just casually trail around the map laying down strap bombs as you fly in a rough circle at max speed or as close as you can get to it, which would mean uh, coming from this trajectory, you would drop a bomb here, then you would drop a bomb there, then you would drop a bomb there, and just kind of go around the circle there, then there, then there, then back over here, maybe over there. Everywhere you can kill a mass extractor. There is a, I'm not sure what the timer is. I, the timer is kind of instinctive, but I don't know what the seconds value is. Torp bombers coming out from rock over here, actually trying to help the Navy on this side, which is a very handy strategy. Um, if you can win a Navy hard enough, that will allow you to take over the map by default because you will be able to blockade this entire shore which takes away a half of the damage potential of the team. You will eliminate a base, possibly two, depending on your faction, and then you will gain control over the center irrevocably. So winning Navy on Sentins is huge, as I'm sure all of you guys are aware. And if one side is stable, which uh, the right side is actually stomping pretty hard at the moment, and can lend assistance to the other side to also win that navy. Both navies, you win the game. I, I don't think I have ever seen a sentence where a, where a team came back from both navies lost unless they had a paragon. If you can get a paragon up, you have a chance. But uh, if you lose both navies, you are pretty much royally screwed. Manslayer pushing down the center now as hard as he can go. He has finally completely broken the front line of Muffin Man. That's going to let him dig into the build power and kill off all of these factories. And when you lose your build power, you lose the game. It is not a pretty picture. 
And this is kind of funny over here. I just noticed this. There is a group of five jesters hanging out, killing off engineers over here. They are just going to town with a single interceptor <laughs> trying to kill them. And one has finally dropped all of these ASF over here and the jesters are just kind of eating away at that side. Now sadly, these Tech 2 subs are fighting a losing battle against the Seraphim Destroyers and here comes a cruiser. There's two cruisers coming in, which means a factory lock is in the near future. Um, there may be enough subs produced in the next couple of seconds. I don't think so. I don't think there's any way that this naval blockade is going to be broken. Because the build power is going down now. We have good targeting from Gizmo Dan. He is a sentence regular, so there's really no need to worry about how he's going to handle this situation. Uh, he is pre-targeting the engineers with many, many clicks to space out his tacks, and that is going to wipe out most of the build power for this player. Now he's going to attack the mass extractors. Honestly, I would probably target the HQ instead, but to each his own. If you can kill the HQ, you dominate the Navy. Muffin Man has actually pulled a very nice move here. He has gone for tech. So Manslayer is still at tech 2. Uh, actually, no, he has just moved to tech 3. And he does not have enough units to push past all of this crap. And Muffin Man has taken that opportunity to drop some bricks on the field with that tech 3 HQ. And that is going to give him basically a mobile firebase. You get two bricks and a loyalist up, they can pretty much walk through any amount of Tech 1 and a substantial amount of Tech 2 thanks to that massive range on the bricks. Uh, no! He walked away. There's one tack right there. You see that? That is the loyalist boomerang feature, which is amazing. And the tack comes back and impacts the friendly because the friendly does not have any tack defense against its own missiles. So, yeah, loyalists are actually your friend against uh, naval bombardment like this, because you can just sit here and spam the ever-living daylights out of loyalists and pretty much wipe out the entire enemy fleet if they're not very careful, because it will bounce all of the tack missiles back into the boats. It is not effective if you're moving in long lines back and forth, but at the moment that is not happening, so yeah. And we have a mistake over here. OMG has moved into the attack range of these Tech 1 point defense with his subs, and I don't understand why we're having sub wars. If one of these guys would switch to Salem's plus Mermaids, it would absolutely own the other person, but I guess we're just going to watch Tech 2 sub spam with mermaids um this is the problem over here the barracuda does have stealth but the stealth doesn't do any good inside the vision radius of another unit and he moved his tech two subs too close the uh the tech two sub can actually attack a tech one torpedo defense without getting hit because the attack range is longer than the vision range of the torpedo launcher. So if you stay out of vision, you can kill the torpedo launcher without taking any damage. But since he moved in with all the factories in the way, he was inside the vision radius of the factories and the torp launchers killed him. So sad, sad day, but sometimes you just can't help it. And so many subs coming out of that one factory. Master Chef is maxing out his mass potential but he does have a whole lot in storage what is he building to burn that much probably those t3 gens that i am seeing right there yes that is what it was so the southern team is actually taking up rather nicely uh their air has a 40 mass income lead which is huge as well as a power income lead and a higher score and then looks like Master Chief is good, but the problem child is Gizmo Dan. Gizmo Dan actually has the highest eco, and you can see what being a sentence regular does for you. 
I've been wondering why his navy was so small, but he's been building just enough navy to suppress his naval opponent and to harass front. And he has dumped it all into eco, which means at 25 minutes, he has all tech 3 mechs and almost all of them capped. Which is not the fastest time you'll ever see, but it is dang good for this rank level. So he's pulling 488 mass per tick. And I am sure, I am 100% positive we're about to see that mass go to use. We've got the Tech 3 Naval Factory online. He is building a battleship with 142 engineers, and he is still positive mass. So that is pretty impressive. Battleship's going to start sailing southward. Actually, it would be awesome if he could get some extra power online, and he does have ASF he's building. He is running a Tech 3 Air Factory, building two gens. That is the new meta. Uh, you do not want you want to finish your power generators before your nuke does, before your nuke finishes. Because if you finish your nuke first, you're not going to get the power adjacency bonus because it only counts towards the unit that is being built after the adjacency takes place. Therefore, if your nuke finishes. Ah, there he did it right. Okay, he paused building at half to finish his power generators. So he already knows this fact, but now you people do too. It's called a learning experience. Yay! Okay, that sounded really terrible because my broke found my voice broke in the middle, but I guess I'll just have to learn to deal with that. <clears throat> Let me recover my sinus cavity. We have a monkey lord right here in the middle. And Muffin Man has actually one-upped most other front players. Most front players build either a radar or possibly upgrade to Omni and then give the Omni to the air player. But Muffin Man has actually just gone straight to Soothsayer, which in retrospect was probably not the best idea because it immediately got shot down by all of these lovely Auroras and Blazes. So, yeah. No more Soothsayer. That was a whole lot of mass gone to waste. And there is the air fight that we've all been anticipating. It actually came out roughly even. Until cruisers. What are the cruisers going to do? Oh, no. No! Tightly clumped ASF versus cruisers is not fun. Not cool at all. But Southern Team did still manage to pull it out got plenty of ASF left over so that is the air winner right here southern team good to go and the front is conquered and the monkey lord has its veterancy and is going to retreat to the rear so much reclaim you can see muffin man is out here in the center now dumping all of that mass into his coffers probably going to build another monkey lord or a megalith gizmo dan Throwing down some Tech 3 sub hunters to help out his navy. Sub hunters are only good if you keep them at maximum range because kiting is their strength. They only have 4,000 health. It's basically like an underwater range bot. But uh, no, once you dive into close quarters, you are going to die, especially versus an Exodus, which has amazing torps. Northern side Navy is looking relatively even, but Master Chief definitely has a huge mass income advantage, a hundred mass income advantage. Gizmo Dan's still climbing. He is at 519 mass per tick. Smoking Dragon leveled off. He is still at 388, which is a very respectable income, but he is not expanding it further. And then on the northern side, Jeremy is only two mass per tick short of smoking. He is at 386, but he does have a lot more power. And Donut on the way. This is going to be the second T4. Yes, second T4. Should be interesting to see what he does with that. I don't know why you would build a Donut when you are not in control of air, but I guess to each his own. T3 Torp Bombers moving in, the terror of the high seas. 
The Solus is a ridiculous unit. It does 4,000 damage per firing cycle, has a very good flight speed, a lot of health, and does an incredibly good job at knocking down Navy. You can take out pretty much any target with just a handful of these, racking up 4,000 damage a pop. Notable mentions are the Tech 3 sub, which dies in one pass, to a Tech 3 Torp Bomber, 4,000 damage, 4,000 health, we're done here. And then also, any of the cruisers die in one pass to a Tech 3, so, uh, Tech 3 Torpedo Bomber. And something interesting to note, the Tech 3 Torpedo Bomber actually costs only two-thirds the mass of a naval unit. So mass for mass, no shielding. No shielding is the key here. Um, Torpedo or uh, T3 torpedo bombers will win over Navy, but the kicker is the shields, which do protect against torps and have boatloads of extra health for dirt cheap. So shields kind of throw a wrench in the works. If you're ever caught with the enemy air pummeling you with torpedo bombers of any sort, but especially solaces then you probably need to add some more shields to your mix so that you can withstand all of that fire. And once again, recovering my sinuses, need to hit the reset button on that sucker. Got a strap bomber coming in for a try to kill. It's going to get shot down. Looks like air control is still... I think it's actually tipping towards the northern team now, which is pretty ridiculous considering the fact that he's also building a donut. Not quite sure how you pull off that high of a production difference when your opponent is at the same level. Oh, they're both overflowing mass. I am so sorry that I looked at that, people. That kind of breaks my heart a little bit. They could be building GCs to throw at each other. Not that any, either one would do any good because it's mutual GCs, so they basically just self-destruct unless you set them around opposite corners of the map. But both of those guys could have built a GC with all of the mass in storage and the plus that they are. Well, yeah, 31,000 mass in storage. Holy kishmolies, that's a lot of mass. Cruisers have moved in to take up residence here. Actually, only two, and then three Salem's and some battleships. So right now, right now, I do have to specify because things may change very rapidly once this donut's online. Um, the southern team is pretty firmly in control of Navy. Um, the two battleships are going to easily take out all this stuff if he just ground fires. I sure hope he doesn't run away from those simple subs because that would be depressing. On the southern side, we have a Tempest, which was rather ill-advised move-wise, but I guess each person is going to do what he or she feels like is best. Tempest will lose to any two battleships of another faction. Any, any two battleships. Hands down, loses one versus two. And the Tempest costs three times as much as a battleship. So you can kind of see the problem there. Yeah, it has 150 range. Yeah, it has a huge splash damage. But in the end, you can buy three regular battleships for the cost of one Tempest. And uh, that is just kind of a bad deal unless you have tons and tons and tons of mass to burn off. One reason people build it, I feel like, is because it does have the extra range. But honestly, just use the melee weapon. Build the Omen class and rush that son of a gun straight down the throat of the opposing team, get into close quarters where they can't dodge, and that brutal projectile speed plus close range makes it very hard to dodge with the capital ships. Now with the, do with the uh, destroyers and with the cruisers, the little T2 vessels, yeah, you can dodge. That is very easy to do. You can dodge battleship fire in pretty much any shape or form, but the Omen class is pretty hard to dodge with another battleship. Just because once you get to fighting range, you are very close to each other. All right.
Alrighty. Got the Caesar on the line. Trying to see if there's any nukes. We got nuke defense. There's our little air fight we've been waiting for. Um, nuke defense. There's our nuke, which is loaded, almost loaded with two, which is kind of interesting. Not having chose to launch that. Over here on yellow side, we have nuke defense and so much power going down. Muffin Man is building away on his SAM launchers and air has a nuke defense, but no nuke. So, whatever. On the northern side, Gray has nuke. Nuke defense. Nuke. No defense. No nuke defense at all. And then over here, we do have... Do not have nuke defense. My goodness, what is it with people not having nuke defense? This whole, um, ah, nice, a beautiful ASF fight now, um, relying on the mids nuke defense is really not that good of an idea because the nuke defense in mid is very easy to snipe. So that can get you in a whole lot of trouble very quickly. Caesar diving straight into the path Oh no, Gray's on the northern team. Okay, so the southern team's ASF is all hanging around on the northern side while the Caesar is just kind of hanging out over top of this megalith, attacking it with depth charges, which you probably didn't know the Caesar has. It does have torpedoes. What? Yes, this weapon can, or this uh, aircraft can literally attack all three unit types in their uh, home territory. It's kind of interesting. Ah, there's a nuke. How did I miss that? Right there. Right freaking there. Nukes ahoy. But the nuke defense is going to catch it, I do believe, unless it is headed for somewhere other than where I think it is. Probably my favorite thing about the Caesar is the flat cannon. Um, the flat cannon is a ridiculously high damage weapon. It does tons of damage. 2,000 range, I think. But it is split between two cannons, one on each side of the Caesar, and they cannot really rotate, so it's basically just firing out the sides. But what you can do with the Caesar is you can, uh, late, late game when you have tons of mass, if you can stack two or three of them up, um, you can stack them and then fly them into battle and they can actually shred ASF because the group health is so high. And as the Caesars are moving around in their stacked configuration, they're moving positions slightly. So ASF attack one, then the other, then the other, then the other. And, uh, in the end, you end up with a very nice little air win for the Caesars with the help of your ASF. They can't win air by themselves, but with the help of ASF, giving you the distraction and laying down all that extra damage, it's very easy to win air when you're right next to a Caesar. And we got two Monkey Lords versus two GCs, and I think we all know who is going to win that fight. Uh, Caesar, or not Caesar, uh, GCs dropping one Monkey Lord with barely even half health reached on the GC. GC is going to get down to about 30% or so, pick up a vet and kill the second Monkey Lord. So the Southern team is now extremely vulnerable. You definitely don't want to be messing with that mess in the center. Purple will overrun you. Yeah, engineers all over the place up here for reclaim, but not where it counts really need to get some engineers on that to get that mass into your treasury. On the southern side, Gizmodan I think is toying with K-Hole. Um, K-Hole is basically out of the game. He has nothing. 
his naval factories have no build power, and he is pretty much just waiting to die at this point. And on the northern side, it's actually the opposite story, because there are lots of Tech 2 subs, but hey, Tort Bombers! Strap Bombers, my bad. Those are Strap Bombers. Four Stealth Strap Bombers. Where they head, I know not, but they are off on a mission. Let's see where they get to. GC still trampling mid cruisers and battleship bearing down on the mid position. I think this is starting to look a little bit like the north one. Um, it has been seesawing back and forth for quite some time here, but it feels like the northern team has just had a little bit of a map control or an eco advantage all along. Well, I say that. Gizmo Dan is the one who has the eco advantage. But I do have to commend the play of the Southern team. They have done a very good job of hanging in there, especially the air player. Smoke and Dragon is up to 402 mass income now, with nearly as high power as the right hand team. But unfortunately, he does not have enough production. So the Northern team is going to win the production war. I'm not sure about numbers though. Yeah, they're way ahead. Never mind then. I keep forgetting that gray is on the northern team. There's so much gray on the southern side. How can this be a northern team if there's that much gray on the southern side? But I think we all know the answer to that question. GC tromp a lomp a lomp a lomp all through the forest. That is the new meta. I bet you didn't know that wrecks give you more mass if you tromp them with the GC. It is a fact of life. They press the minerals between their feet into shiny diamonds that are worth incredible amounts of mass, and you can then cash them in for your favorite toys. So much cruiser fire. You guys have got to forgive me. I am feeling kind of out of it right now. I'm actually a bit loopy. I feel like I'm on autopilot, and I'm basically drifting in and out of a nap. I had very little sleep last night and the night before that so I'm pretty much just kind of hanging out in the twilight zone here and trying not to fall asleep in the middle of a cast which is admittedly a pretty decent game this is very evenly matched everywhere except for this navy Gizmo Dan has obviously overpowered this navy mostly due to experience of play um, experience in play he is a regular sentence player, and I don't remember K-Hole from anywhere. And that's not to say that K-Hole doesn't play sentence, because obviously uh, K-Hole did build Navy, did build very early Navy, and tried for a naval steal where he can force the other person out of the water, but uh, overall just was not nearly experienced enough to provide a real opponent to Gizmo Dan. Everywhere else, though, it was a pretty good matchup. Muffin Man failed a bit late, but that is uh, not entirely his fault. And we do have another nuke coming up the mid. Where oh where will it land? No one knows. It will not land anywhere because, hey, there's a nuke defense. We've got, let's see, three anti-nukes loaded. And where did the nuke go? Did the nuke get killed? Don't understand. The nuke was right there, I think. Or did he reclaim it? He may have reclaimed it to get more, um, more navy. I'm not sure. It never did launch. I don't remember anything killing it. This is very strange. I think these people might be doing this just to toy with my head. Yes, that's right. A week ago, someone sent me this replay, and they knew at that time that I would be incredibly sleepy today, and that I would try to cast it, and that I would get distracted easily, and so they gave me squirrel material to play with because they knew that I would be brain dead. So, yeah, of course it is because Illuminati and stuff. Skathis going up over here. Actually, Skathis is an amazing choice. If you think you're going to lose the Navy, Skathis is an amazing choice because it does uber high damage on tons of range. 
But in this case, I think the Skathis is actually being built more because the middle is collapsing. The middle is not looking very healthy at all, and that Skathis is going to allow the southern team to blanket fire pretty much the entire southern half of the map. Um, try to find a range ring here. I'm losing my mind, I swear. Cannot focus. Ah, not choosing the correct person, so that's why. Um, yeah. Air has now been won very, very hard by the Northern team. It was an interesting air game, and it was anybody's air game until about three minutes ago. But at this point, uh, Jeremy Wordy just has so much more production, it's not even funny. And then couple that with Manslayer's GC coming up the mid, that is just going to tear a hole directly into the heart of this southern team. Got another GC going up right here, but not going up very quickly. It's basically a single tech 3 engineer with a limited mass supply that is going to try to build that thing. I don't think is going to get done anytime this century. And Tech 2 Point Defense going down, only to make the situation worse. GC stomping into the base, tromping about, and he's going to do what GCs do best. Pillage the village and violate all the women. Okay, maybe that's not what the GC does best, but it sounded kind of okay at the moment. Got a Megalith bearing down on this Tech 3 Naval Factory. That is just a factory, that is not the HQ. If he could kill the HQ, that would actually do him a whole lot of good. But at the moment, it looks like he's just going for regular targets. Got gunships trying to solve the problems of the southern team, but I just don't think that's going to happen. And a nuke! Question is, is it going to bypass the anti-nuke? I am thinking probably not, but then again, there's some really weird anti-nuke configuration in the northern team so maybe it will got one out of five loaded there so one shot placed wrongly and it is gone oh my no no way air player is down <laughs> oh that's nice that is very nice Nuke is going to kill off the air player's ACU. That is that is probably the best thing that could happen to the southern team at the moment. That is going to dump off all the responsibility for air on Gizmo Dan, which means he's going to have to reevaluate his choices eco and production wise, and it's going to split the APM because you have one less person watching the screen. So there's really no bad thing to this at this point in the game. The only disadvantage is going to be handing double eco into the hands of the other player, but I don't think that's going to be a big deal because I fear that the end is nigh for Smoking Dragon. He is chasing down some Harbingers and he is dangerously close to that ACU and a nuke on... Oh, holy cow. What? What? Somebody launched eight nukes. That is beautiful. That is beautiful, and that is also a naval nuke. And there is no way. <laughs> oh, there is no way to stop that many nukes. Well done, Gizmo Dan. You stole a page out of my book with the multiple, multiple, multiple naval nukes. I will give up my secret here and now for how to pull the Desinuke for those of you who are interested. Um, the Scathis is online, by the way, and it is lobbing projectiles over towards the mid where the support commander is starting to throw up some factories for reclaim. Well, what you gotta do is you gotta build 10 nuke launching naval vessels without turning on the nuke. And then make sure that you have enough power to do this correctly. I think Master Chef just gave up the ghost, decided that he didn't want to take it anymore, and he bailed on existence. Wonderbar. Um, 
So you build 10 nuke launching thingamajiggers, and then you need to build far away and above what power you think you need, because you're going to be pulling, you know, like 60, 70k power. K-hole going down there. Oh well. Um, and then you need to start all of your nukes building at the same time. Because if you start them all building at the same time, then they will all finish at the same time, which means that you can pick 10 individual targets while your nuke subs are loading, and as soon as they finish building, they will all launch. And you get 10 simultaneous nukes that will then obliterate the map. And it is absolutely hilarious to do and hilarious to watch and uh, offers a great amount of fun. And this is this is very nice. I gotta compliment Gizmo Dan. Very nicely done on the showy finish. Got Strat Bombers coming in to kill off the rest of the Navy up there. These guys just need to zoom in on that ACU and kill it. We can get this game over with and get on with our lives. Harbies, Harbies galore. I gotta say, Manslayer, well done on that mid slot. Bringing in all of that tech. Got so many tech four on the map and a whole buttload of Harbingers. And both navies, very nice. That was a solid win. I won't say that is the greatest sentence game that I've ever seen. But it was definitely a solid one, and it had some really interesting tactics used and some cool stuff happening. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Hopefully my commentary was not too absolutely dry. I promise that I will be back on top of my game before I do the next cast. I am finally getting over being sick. Finally. My head mostly unstopped today. Maybe I'll be over the cough and everything else in the next two days and be back up on my feet, ready and raring to go, with all of my enthusiasm intact. But till that happens, thank you so much guys for watching and dealing with my mediocrity while I fight this off. Hopefully you enjoyed the cast regardless, and as always, thank you for your support. I will see you guys in the next cast. Adios.